why would we look at a person this way? He's behaving badly. Why did they say, <coughs> I'll hold such a rare one? Why rare? Why precious treasure? Any ideas? Because he will test all the qualities we want to develop in ourselves. Mm. Of compassion of mm. So mm. that's why he, he in a way is very dear. Because he puts us to test what all we want to be. Are such people rare? Or are they getting more common <laughs> nowadays? <laughs> more common. <laughs> we might think we're surrounded by these people. Yeah. When this Lama was writing, it was a very pure time. It's quite rare to find such bad-mannered people uh, with negative energy. Yeah. So it's like a precious treasure because if we're really committed to the path of training the mind, we don't just want people around us all the time who are being nice to us. It's nice to have people around us who are being pleasant and kind. But as you say, it's very, very well, it's not testing us much. You know, like then we take samsara for granted. Well, actually, samsara is okay. People are all behaving so nicely. You know, it's what Buddha talking about. Why are people talking about suffering even? But then you have someone who abuses you, gives you a hard time, cheats you very badly, hacks into your computer or whatever, mm. or into your debit card, and you find you've lost lots of money. Mm. Now, this is a bad person with bad nature, negative energy. Uh, how, how to cope with our feelings for that, you see? <clears throat> They're the one who's testing us. Uh, they're really testing us. Not the person who brings us flowers and biscuits and, uh, you know, mutteries. These people are easy to deny, easy to like, you know. But, uh, yeah, the person who isn't behaving well, that's the one. Then, of course, that can be taken even to a great, greater level. Uh, connected with what you said about patience, where the author says, uh, when someone I benefited and in whom I have placed great trust hurts me very badly, I'll practice seeing that person as my supreme teacher. So this is a very difficult one. It could be a parent with their child, they so many sacrifices for the child and take care. Then when they're older, they uh, somehow abuse the parents or have no gratitude, uh, create many problems for the parents, whatever it is that happens so often. And the parent may have put a lot of faith in the child, a lot of expectations in the child. So then they get hurt badly by that uh, person. So then, wow, you're supposed to see that person as your supreme teacher. You know, you thought... Someone else, Dalai Lamaji or somebody, was your supreme teacher. <laughs> <laughs> then this text is saying, maybe you have two supreme teachers, you know. This person who, basically someone who uh, what is it, stabs you in the back, as they say. Who, uh, who uh, what's it called? Uh, mm, what's the simple English word? Who, yeah, betrays you, betrays. in a sense. Who uh, betrays your trust. Uh, a normal person would be grateful, or, you know, and, and they act exactly the opposite. They harm you. You, you, you help them with a good heart, maybe? Maybe mixed with a bit of delusion, of course, because we're all a bit deluded. But basically, you help them for, say, 20, 30 years, <laughs> and now they're harming you. You know? Of course, it may be deliberately or maybe not deliberately, but what they're doing is harming you. Wow. I'm supposed to see them as my supreme teacher. Given Mahayana logic, it's actually it's, it's very true. No person in their normal state of mind would repay kindness with uh, bad behavior or careless behavior. Mm -hmm. The fact the person is doing this shows that they're suffering. They're insane to some degree. They need, they need help. They are, yeah, they're suffering. So, <clears throat> proper response has to be, you know, Together with that pain we are feeling, we have to see, wow, this person is really teaching me what compassion might mean, what patience might actually mean. It's not just a conceptual idea of being a decent person who's quite patient or, you know, doesn't mind too much when others behave a little badly. But this is the real test, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And for us it could be even something small. 
uh, you're helping somebody for a while or <clears throat> for a day or two, and uh, they just don't say thank you. That would be considered. That can be very painful for some people. It was painful for me recently. I didn't even do much. I just uh, in Bodh Gaya there were two people I felt uh, should meet each other. You know, I felt there were two people who should meet each other. So then, uh, without much difficulty, I I, I I able to I was able to engineer the conditions for those two people to meet. Yeah, and it was a very good meeting. They had a good time. I, uh, I mainly listened, which is what I was planning to do anyway because these two people had plenty to talk about. <clears throat> but then later, when neither of them even mentioned the meeting or said thank you, then I was thinking, wow. And, and it was interesting for me, because both these people are, are people I uh, respect quite a bit. So then I, um, on one level, so then I realized maybe it's also for my benefit, they're doing it like this. <laughs> you know, since they're not, in my mind, totally ordinary people, <clears throat> So these two people I helped to meet, and they, they didn't say thank you, anything. You know? I mean, in one way, what is there to thank you? I haven't done them a huge favor, maybe. But when the mind is attuned to wanting recognition, wanting acceptance, wanting to be thanked. So then one of the great slogans in <laughs> mind training teachings, which is so useful just to think of this one slogan, is don't expect thanks. Don't expect thanks. What an amazing teaching. Mm -hmm. Three words. We always want thanks. If I just pass the salt to you, I want you to say thank you. <laughs> or at least look pleased. <laughs> then if I do an hour's work for you or buy something from the shops for you because you're sick or whatever, I expect you to say thank you. <laughs> of course, it's interesting, isn't it? Mothers do this for their children and don't expect thank you very often. For younger children, of course, maybe. When the child is older, they're expected to say thank you. But I think many mothers also wouldn't expect that from an older child. I mean, I, I notice that I have, and I'm not a special person, I'm not saying that, but I notice that at home I have this wish to somehow thank our cook who cooks us three meals a day. I mean, two meals in my case. I cook my own breakfast. But he, he shops, he cooks, washes up, I feel some sense of uh, gratitude towards that person. I don't go around saying thank you to him after every meal, of course, but I, I make sure I kind of say thank you and good night to him in the evening when he's washed up and is, and is about to go back upstairs to his room. You know. But none of the other people in the house would, would think of saying thank you. Never say. Never. Maybe it's a cultural thing in India, I don't know. Maybe I've been too long in the West as a child. But, uh, yeah, anyway, what this teaching means is in samsara, in degenerate times, like we have, don't expect thanks. What happens if you do expect thanks? You're just inviting trouble. Doesn't matter what you did. You could have saved that person's life. But don't expect thanks. Just be happy you did something beneficial. Rejoice, that would be something. Rejoice in, is something very much emphasized in the teachings. You know, I helped somebody, I saved their life. Wow, human life, so precious. I saved it. How wonderful it is. How wonderful it is. Be really happy. But don't expect them to thank you. Because, why? Because as we know from our own experience, don't we? Sometimes we're so caught up in our own inner drama, aren't we, that we're careless. We forget. We're really just so caught up in our own drama, our own problems, our own garbage, as Lama Yeshe would say. My first teacher, one of my first teachers, was caught up in our own inner garbage mind. So they forget, or, or they never intended to, or they're deliberately using us. Okay. As Rinpoche says, a bodhisattva should be so happy when someone is using them. That's what I'm here for, he would say. A bodhisattva is there to be used by others. Even though if other people are using you like toilet paper or <laughs> Kleenex tissue, it's okay, I'm a bodhisattva. I'm, 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 there to, I'm there for others. Others are sick, they're suffering. I don't expect them to behave well. 
especially in this degenerate time, why am I expecting them to behave well? Why am I expecting all this? When Buddha said, first noble truth is suffering, and there's so many causes of suffering, which are so powerful. So why am I expecting people to behave well? I shouldn't. I'm stupid to do that, actually. I should expect them to behave badly. I should expect them not to say thank you. If we train our mind in that way, then of course we can have all these little pleasant surprises when people do say thank you or do say a kind word. Then it feels so good because you trained your mind as a good warrior to, uh, to expect the worst, to, to be prepared, let's say, for the worst. You're prepared. <coughs> That's why these early teachings are so important. You see the results of karma. If you haven't been thankful or a grateful person in the past, you're not easily going to be grateful and thankful now. So don't expect everyone to have started with some innocent, clean, wonderful baby slate and you know, then you know, getting damaged by life. None of us came into this world with a clean slate. Hmm. And of course, some of us are say thank you too often, and it gets embarrassing, isn't it? Some people <laughs> overgrateful. As soon as you do something good for them, they immediately do something good back. It's like almost too much, you know. So how to be skillful, how to... That's difficult for human beings. So anyway, I find more and more that slogan is very useful. Don't expect thanks. Don't expect also, together with that, um, appreciation. It, it covers a lot of things. Don't expect gratitude. In other words, don't expect too much anyway. Remember what Milarepa said? He said, um, <clears throat> like a lion, I have no fear. Like an elephant, I have no anxiety. Like a madman, I have no expectation and no hope. I tell you the honest truth. Of course, it didn't mean Milarepa was hopeless and was in his cave depressed, but it means he has no unrealistic hope or expectation of samsara. Samsara is suffering. People's minds are degenerate. What can you hope or expect from them? You know? Of course, it doesn't mean he was hopeless. He had his practice, he <coughs> had his amazing guru. He didn't need to be hopeless. Can't he change people? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> you have a very fresh experience. How can we change people? Wrong question, isn't it? How do you change yourself? Thank you. <laughs> Saved by the Scots. <laughs> Practical. Could you say it in a Scots accent? <laughs> We have to save ourselves. How do you save yourself? We have to save ourselves. We have to save ourselves. Yes, <laughs> we have to save ourselves. See, you have to save yourself. And then others will be inspired by your example. <laughs> and then you'll be able to help them without, if you're trying to help them without from a situation forceful. of me. Forceful. Huh? Without being forceful. Well, no, it's not about being forceful. You could be very forceful as a bodhisattva, but you are beyond hope and fear. You just see clearly what has to be done out of your wisdom and compassion, and you do it. And if there's nothing to be done right then, you don't do it. You don't say, oh, I couldn't help this person right now. No, not at all. As a bodhisattva, you never think that way. And of course, you constantly pray for others. <clears throat> you constantly hope that your life is meaningful for others. That's one of the prayers, isn't it, of the bodhisattva? Anyone who abuses me, whatever they think of me, whether it's good or bad, may it be meaningful for them. So you always have that thought there which helps others at some subtle level, maybe. At least helps you not to be upset. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point here is how to stop ourselves being our own worst enemy by having all these expectations of other people. Why should we have expectations of lunatics? Right? We're all in a, we're all in a lunatic asylum, according to Lord Buddha. Some are more lunatic than others. But we're all grasping at something We've been grasping at something since beginningless life, time, which is a hallucination, the sense of an inherent, solid, independent I. There's nothing more hallucinatory than that. So we're all basically hallucinating, according to Lord Buddha. We don't see anything clearly and properly until we have very high realizations. So we're all, we're all in a loony bin. So how can we expect other lunatics to behave properly? We can't. It's stupid. And we know from our own experience that sometimes we behave very badly. We behave ungratefully. I think we all might remember something. 
I remember once really hurting my mother by criticizing or showing her, yeah, criticizing her cooking or when it was so painful, immediately I regretted it because I saw the pain on her face. Here was someone who wasn't very well and who cooked and cleaned and clo you know washed our clothes for his children before she got a washing machine. You know, it was, I felt, wow. but you know, I really hurt her by saying what I did. We're so ungrateful sometimes. We don't recognize other people's efforts for us. You know? So it's not like I haven't, we haven't also done this. So anyway, uh, that's one uh, very, uh, very useful teaching. To the person who returns your goodness with harm, they're your guru. They teach us something. Uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the verses from uh, the eight verses for transforming the mind. The key thing is to try and again and again see how people are, uh, how we are mm, equal with others in so many respects. The basics, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Seeing how they are suffering. Remembering their kindness. And the kindness, of course, we, we could have a whole session on the kindness of others, just by thinking about your own life. And, and everything you have and use and enjoy, it comes through the efforts of others. Even your mind, you could say, uh, due to the efforts of others, it was given a home in this human body. If it wasn't for your parents, you could have a home in a, you know, you could have been reborn in a scorpion body or a worm or a slug or a, you know, a cat or a dog or a bird or someone in Syria, born in Syria, in a conflict situation, immediately you're born, or, or you grow up a bit and then there's this horrendous conflict, uh, which totally destroys your peace and happiness, maybe your whole life is then tormented by that. So you see, we, we have um, <clears throat> much to be grateful for. Does a, a Syrian refugee have much to be grateful for? Well, that's a tricky question, isn't it? They don't have a precious human rebirth from our point of view because their life there's too much suffering just to survive and so forth. But some of them are also grateful for their life, actually. Like one who was interviewed, I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. They had escaped from Aleppo, this town in northern Syria, which is like a hell run of people being killed with the Iraqi army trying to flush out the rebels and so forth. So it became a hell run for the citizens. So uh, one family had escaped, <clears throat> they were in a camp somewhere, and the camp wasn't, you know, we wouldn't want to live in that camp, but, you know, they had shelter, they were free from the fighting, they were getting some food and drink every day. The guy said, I feel like I'm in heaven, you know, I feel like I'm in heaven. So, you know, he, he was grateful for what he had, but of course, if you were to ask a, a Syrian child or mother or whatever, are you grateful for your life? I think they might say if they were in a refugee camp, yeah, at least I'm grateful to be alive. But still, you know, a lot of problems in life. But here we're speaking of Dharma practitioners, supposed to be practitioners who have a good situation. If we can't see our life as, as uh, beneficial and being, um, you know, a very precious life, then, then who is? Who is going to feel this way? Even presidents big people, they don't have the leisure, the opportunity we have, do they? I wouldn't want to be President Trump right now, for many reasons, partly because it's just such a stressful situation, being someone unqualified for a job, and with a lot of other people who are unqualified for the job, and being attacked left, right and center by the press, and uh, so on and so forth. I, th th there's no opportunity for him to practice Dharma. I mean, I don't think he has a Dharma teacher. The way he talks suggests that he doesn't have much control over his speech, you know. And he obviously has a lot of problems, inner problems. It seems very clear to me, very clear. And how his wife keeps that smile on her face, I have no idea. <laughs> she was a model. She has to model. smile all the time. Yes, at the back. Whenever, when I was coming, it's yeah. just like I think someone was going around. So huh? just, when I was coming here, yes. to this IIT crossing, I saw a small little child. Yeah. And somehow this whole thought 
was coming, like what will happen, this child uh, doesn't have any food and she has to kind of beg for her food. And I am now going into a place where like at least I feel so calm and nice. So I think we were just saying the same, but could you just maybe from this, like I think we were talking the same sort of thing. A Syrian refugee might be feeling uh, comfortable that he or she is alive. Hmm. Now this child, as such, biologically, she is alive. But, like, I, I feel I'm so blessed I'm here. But this child is just maybe five minutes walk from this place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what's I, I your point? Like, what I'm trying to say is, like, what is the difference between that child and me? Causes and conditions. Mm -hmm. Karma. 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 Present causes and conditions created by delusion and karma, but that should, uh, of course, not make us think, "Oh, they just they need to, they deserve what they got." That's why we have to generate compassion. That's why people want. Some people want to generate the mind of a bodhisattva. That it's such a desperate situation in this world. People are suffering so much. I must do, develop the strength of mind and the courage to be able to do what I can for others. Which, of course, doesn't mean I can do much right now. Even the Buddhas haven't stopped begging on the streets of Delhi. Why not? It's because mm -hmm. Buddhas aren't all powerful. They're all wise, all loving. But it doesn't mean you can stop people from have, experiencing the effects of their negative karma, you know, and the conditions and causes, conditions that have come up in the world. Buddhas and God, well, Buddhas, let's stick to Buddhas. They're not all powerful. If they were, they'd have, you know, made sure we were all awake, you know, awakened by now. They're not all powerful. What they do know is the medicine that can save us and make us fully awakened, if we take it. Now that child at the crossroads has no opportunity right now to, of a precious human life which has all the conditions for practicing Dharma. You need to study that teaching before you fully understand what we mean. But It's not just enough to have a human body, obviously. You need a human body with all kinds of wonderful causes and conditions also available, like you are saying, you can come and sit here and get some benefit. Most people can't. Most people aren't interested even. So even though they have everything else, if they have no interest, mm -hmm. you know, then they won't be here and getting some benefit, hopefully. So it's all due to causes, conditions. You know? Which is also a good thing, because when the causes, conditions change, or when that person also may you know, develop Finish some other, the then they can help, help themselves. And, you know, maybe generate some causes for a precious human life in the future. But right now it's bleak. For most human beings, it's very bleak. Most human beings aren't behaving in a way that will ensure that they get a human life in the future at all. Because the at least the causes of a good human life, which I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, which all of you students remember who are there. My uncle, I'm picking on you today, because your boss is away, so I'm picking on you. <laughs> so... Uh, um, what are the causes, the three main causes for having a precious human life? Not just any old human life, a precious one with the opportunity to practice Dharma. Can you remember? Could you hazard a guess? Would they be positive causes or negative? Positive. So what kind of things might ensure us being able to have this amazing, uh, you know, sort of uh, scenario where we are able to investigate? Whenever human rebirth, I, I think... Uh, Precious I human rebirth. I don't know. The human rebirth, I know, is generosity. Of food. I, I don't know. In I'm general, sorry. yeah, they often... We, they mention that as a cause for the precious human life, actually. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you're right. To even get a human body, there needs to be some good throwing karma. If you divide it up into different kinds of karma, there has to be some positive throwing karma. Uh, which would involve some kind of morality or goodness, presumably. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for this human body, specifically, really generous outlook uh, and, and spiritual giving. Practice in an earlier life? That would help, I'm sure. That would definitely help. Definitely help. But they speak of three, don't they? They speak of generosity, pure morality, which is also very difficult to generate even one pure moral conduct in these degenerate times, you know? Like just to... Even the... Great uh, Avalokiteshvara started crying, you know, it is said in one beautiful story, and he felt he couldn't help others enough. And here he was, the Buddha of compassion, or 
he couldn't help others enough and he was crying <clears throat> and so then uh, from his tears another aspect of Buddha energy was born you know, Tara female aspect of enlightened energy quick enlightened energy activity so uh, but yeah he, he, so you could say even the, even the great bodhisattvas and buddhas even they get uh, upset sometimes that they can't help others mm -hmm. it's just a story but it shows that yeah, it is. It's a desperate situation, isn't it? It's like seeing someone going to their doom, in a sense. Yeah. Like somebody running towards the edge of the cliff. And you can't stop through them. ignorance, and you can't stop them for whatever reason, mm -hmm. either because they have a gun in their hand and they're threatening mm -hmm. to kill you if you follow them, yeah. or whatever, yeah. or they don't know the cliff is there, whatever. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we just can't help people, and and that's why we have to. Be satisfied with the greatest gift we can give ourselves in the world is to uh, work on our mind and, and develop equanimity. equanimity and great compassion and bodhicitta. And that will be the best the, help. Even for myself in this situation. Well, of course. I'm suffering so much. Yeah, you have to see that it's um, unskillful to have yeah, so much see suffering. The karma. Yeah, you, you can't take on their personal karma. I can't change it anyway. Not this life, it seems like. Not yet. Who knows? They could have some experience which uh, opens up their minds a bit, opens a little crack. That will, could come also through a lot of prayer from your side. Since you have a karmic connection with them, it says that uh, those who make prayers for others, having a karmic connection with them is a very powerful uh, ingredient. Also powerful is being a very pure person, morally very pure, having many vows, that can help. But just being uh, karmically connected as a family member can help your prayers for them to be more powerful than uh, most third party Thank prayers. You. I want you to bring them here and they told me to shut up. Yes. Mm -hmm. You better drug them and tie them up and bring them. <laughs> then when they wake up here, at least they'll see some positive energies before they run Plain out rude. screaming. Hmm? Plain rude. Re rude. Rude, yeah. yeah. So there you are, you have the person in, uh, in mm -hmm. that verse. Yeah? Perfect example of that person. You know? So it says, when, uh, whenever I meet a person of bad nature who's overwhelmed by negative energy and intense suffering, I'll hold such a rare one dear, as if I'd found a precious treasure. It doesn't say anything about, oh, I must help them, I must go out and you know, change their mind. It says, what, what, what does it mean for you and your spiritual development? Then, when others out of jealousy mistreat me with abuse, slander, and so on, I'll practice accepting defeat, offer the victory to them. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit connected. If they say bad things, you just take it. Okay. You accept. I mean, not always, but... And then, if have you benefited them at all in the past? Do you feel? Yes, I do. Yeah, so then they hurt you very badly, tell you to get lost, I'm and so for forth. Them now. Yeah. See them as your teacher. Then, of course, if one really advances in the practice, one can do what the next verse says. In short, I will offer directly and indirectly every benefit and happiness to all beings, my mothers. I will practice in secret, taking upon myself all their harmful actions and sufferings. This refers to the practice of taking and giving, which you may have done with uh, Venerable Namjong. We imagine taking on all their suffering. It's obvious they have a lot, these two beings. You take it and as you also then later as you breathe out, you give them blissful energy and energy which transforms into whatever they need for their happiness, you know, purifies them. That's all we can do. It's a big deal also to do it, to actually do that practice of taking and giving. You're, help, you're, you're powerfully working on your own compassion and love and certainly can't have any harmful effect on them. But you shouldn't do the practice in front of them, saying, oh, I'm praying for you, I'm taking on your suffering. They'll just tell you that you're stupid. You know, or, or, they don't need it, thank you. Yeah, they'll say they don't I'm need it. Or, stop showing off your Buddhist credentials, <laughs> whatever they may say. So that's why the <laughs> teaching, you. you have to thank do it you. in secret. Thank you so much. No one should know you're doing uh, taking and giving practice. And my worrying and suffering is not going to help anybody. I don't think so. But you can check. Maybe your logical yeah, mind is not so. yet clear. 
you might think, well, maybe there is a good thing about it. No, no, no. At least it helps me pass the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not do my work. Yeah. Yeah. It's it certainly has work. that quality. So anyway, 120, I'm happy to yak on, but some of you may have other things to do with your life, with your precious mm -hmm. human life. Uh, it's up to you. We can finish now. Anybody have to go now, they, then they should go. We might go on a few more minutes, not sure. Uh, maybe there'll be a session next Saturday, not sure. Most probably. I expect to be here. <coughs> Today's the 18th, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So 25th, yeah, I expect to be here. Um, <coughs> but the main, the, yeah, the main thing is we have to be aware of what's coming up in my mind. How am I dealing with it? And studying will help because then you then you get all this rich information and uh, commentaries by uh, highly realized people who, who not just talking like me but who actually practice. So then it's very valuable, very valuable to hear it from, even to read something by a realized person is very very uh, powerful rather than just someone who repeating it what they heard from someone else. <coughs> So I encourage you to study more.